So let me begin today by making clear that Amer America's commitment to NATO and to Article 5 remains ironclad. As President Biden said a couple of days ago, we will, if we must, defend every inch of NATO territory. There's no reason, of course, that it should, come, it should ever come to this. Just like there's no reason for Russia to again invade Ukraine. Ukraine does not threaten anyone, let alone its Russian neighbors. And yet, that is what Moscow would have us believe. And that is how Mr. Putin continues to justify his assembly of significant combat power. Now, the Russians say that they are withdrawing some of those forces now that exercises are complete, but we don't see that. Quite the contrary, we see them add to the more than 150,000 troops that they already have arrayed along that border, even in the last couple of days. We see some of those troops inch closer to that border. We see them fly in more combat and support aircraft. We see them sharpen their readiness in the Black Sea. We even see them stocking up their blood supp supplies. You know, I was a soldier myself not that long ago, and I know firsthand that you don't do these sort of things for no reason. And you certainly don't do them if you're getting ready to pack up and go home. So we and our allies will stay vigilant. We will watch for the so-called false flag operations, where Russia manufactures a, a dramatic event to justify an attack, a play that we've seen them run in the past. And we will continue to explore ways to enhance our readiness as the United States and others have done with additional troop deployments to NATO's eastern flank. And we will, we will closely match Russian words to Russian deeds, what they say to what they actually do. Of course, one thing that Mr. Putin says he wants to do is to engage in more dialogue. And as we have said all along, we would welcome that. We believe there's still time and space for diplomacy to work, and we are in lockstep with our allies and partners towards that end. A peaceful outcome that respects Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity represents the best outcome for Ukraine, to be sure, but also for Russia and the Russian people. If Mr. Mr. Putin is serious about achieving that sort of outcome, he will find in the United States and in this alliance no better or more serious interlocutor. And if he's not, as his deeds thus far tend to indicate, it will be clear to the entire world that he started a war with diplomatic options left on the table. It will be Mr. Putin who will bear the responsibility for the suffering and the immense sacrifice that ensues. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, this business of national security. I joined the United States Army in the middle of the Cold War, and I have served and fought alongside NATO allies for the better part of my adult life. But I can honestly say that I have never seen the alliance more re relevant and more united and more resolute than I see it today. Mr. Putin says that he doesn't want a strong NATO on his western flank. He's getting exactly that. I'll soon depart for Poland and then to Lithuania to spend some time with these strong allies who likewise take these obligations seriously. I'll visit with their troops and mine, see their leaders, talk with mine, and talk about how together we can bolster 
the defense of the Alliance. I'd also like to add my appreciation to Bulgaria, who just today agreed to host a U.S. Army striker company for joint training opportunities. Now, these troops will be departing Germany in the coming days, and they'll help ensure our readiness and our interoperability with Bulgaria as our NATO ally. All that is to say that I leave here incredibly proud of the alliance and satisfied in, in the knowledge that we will be sure-footed in the face of aggression, but dedicated, as always, to the prospect of peace. Harry Truman, the American president when NATO was found, or founded, put it best when he noted that though peace was difficult, war was not inevitable. And so it is today. There is nothing inevitable about this looming conflict. It can still be averted. The, pl the path of diplomacy may be difficult, but it is still worth the trek. And NATO, as I said, remains sure-footed. Thank you, and I'll stop there and, and uh, be happy to take a couple of questions. Okay. Our first question will go to Phil Stork from uh, Reuters. Uh, Mr. Secretary, who is responsible for the shelling today in Ukraine's Donbass region, and how concerning is it? And what are you doing to lower the risk of dangerous and potentially explosive U.S.-Russia interactions, uh, like the close call between aircraft this weekend? Well, we've seen the reports of the shelling, and Phil, and they're certainly troubling. Uh, we're still gathering the details. But, you know, we've said for some time that the Russians might do something like this in order to justify uh, a military con a conflict. So we'll be watching this very closely. And in terms of any potential, uh, pot potential uh, interaction with our aircraft and, and someone else's aircraft, of course, we'll follow our, our own procedures very closely, which I think are our airmen are very well rehearsed on, and uh, we'll make sure that we're doing everything that we can to remain safe in the air. And if we see unsafe acts, we'll certainly uh, demarch the people that are responsible for that. Next question goes to Bettina Klein from uh, German Radio. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Um, I understand you have the evidence that there's more troop building uh, rather than troop withdrawal uh, in Russia. At the same time, I hear some skepticism, certainly in the German public debate. How can we trust this? How can we trust uh, American intelligence? What do you suggest to build more public trust? And would you consider at one point to uh, make more evidence you have publicly available? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I don't see this as a competition of narratives. I think, uh, you know, we've been very transparent about, about everything that, uh, that we've seen thus far. Uh, and uh, we've shared what we, what we know with our allies and partners. And we, we really have done uh, a very, very uh, uh, extensive uh, job of making sure that our allies knew what we knew as soon as possible. Uh, but I think in order to address the issues that the issue that you that you raised, uh, the solution is to continue to be transparent, to continue to, you know, talk to uh, to the American people and, and people around the world, quite frankly, and, and, and explain what we're seeing. Uh, and uh, and I think, you know, that that has been very helpful thus far. We will continue to do that. And we certainly endeavor to do that uh, while we're in this conference this week. Next question goes to uh, Carla Babb, Voice of America. Thank you for doing this. Ukraine is calling this week's cyber attack the largest in the country's history. Can you confirm whether Russia was behind this attack? 
And President Biden last month said that if something short of an invasion happens, like if Russia continued to use cyber attacks, the U.S. could respond in a similar way with cyber. So uh, has the U.S. responded to the latest attack? And if not, why not? In terms of confirming whether or not uh, this was Russia that was behind us, uh, we, again, uh, the, the intelligence community continues to assess uh, what, what happened there. But I will just point, to you, point out to you that uh, uh, this is a play taken out of his, uh, his playbook. You know, we, we would expect to see, uh, before any attack, we would expect to see uh, cyber attacks, uh, false flag activities, uh, and, and, a, and a number of other things, increasing uh, uh, rhetoric in the information space. And we're beginning to see uh, more and more of that. In terms of a response to the cyber attack, if someone attacks the United States of America, then certainly you know, we, will, we will hold that, that element responsible or accountable uh, in, uh, in at this point, nobody, you know, we, we haven't seen it. We, ha we have not been attacked. NATO elements have not been attacked. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Okay, last question today goes to Natalia Drozdiak from uh, Bloomberg. Where are you, Natalia? There you are. Where are you? I'm here. The there, um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the question. Um, so some of these troops that we've seen Russia mass along Ukraine's border have come from very far um, parts of uh, Russia's territory, including the Far East. So why do you think Russia feels comfortable enough to leave that border with China undefended? Does this represent a closer alliance between the two? Thank you. Well, you know, certainly uh, I can't speak to the to the strength of that alliance. Uh, what I can say, and I, I'm not sure it infers uh, anything at all, uh, but we did note with, uh, with alarm uh, China's tacit approval of uh, Putin's activities here in, in the region. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, we, can, we can make any kind of uh, direct inference from, uh, from what you just raised, but certainly those are things that we'll continue to, uh, to watch going forward. But I think you raise a very, very interesting and important question. So, thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. That concludes today's uh, presser. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.